seems Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg is moving full speed ahead in the hush money case against Donald Trump. Michael Cohen confirmed with me on Friday that he met with prosecutors from the DA's office for more than six hours this week. The case is set to begin on March 25th and will be Trump's first criminal trial to get underway. Joining us now, former personal attorney to Donald Trump, Michael Cohen. He is the host of the Mea Culpa and Political Beatdown podcast and author of Revenge, How Donald Trump Weaponized the Department of Justice Against His Critics and Disloyal, a memoir. Hey. That's a title right there, honey. <laughs> Michael Cohen, it's, hey, it's, good to, it's so good to see you. Um, okay, the meeting, you had a long meeting with the prosecutors. What did you discuss? Without compromising the upcoming trial, why was the meeting so long? What did you all talk about? Well, obviously, there's a lot of review that's going into this, but I think we were talking more about Trump's uh, newest venture, of course, those hideous-looking sneakers that he's out hawking in order to go raise some money. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was up at about 4 o'clock this morning, and I, I came up with an entire campaign. I have decided my next chapter of my life, I want to be like Mad Men. I want to go into advertising. Donald, in his mind, actually thinks he's a combination of, like, Michael Jordan, my old client Kanye, um, you know, or Off-White, all smashed into one grifter, right? So those we're going to call... Just so you guys hear it from me first, the hair felons. I'm telling you, it's the right name for it. But this is how he made a lot of his money, right? The, the merchandising mm. is actually, Michael, not a surprise move. No. We know he is cash-strapped. We know that is right. part of the issue here. So he can sell off assets. He can sell off properties. How much money can he actually make merchandising his name? Give us a sense. Well, if you look to see, like, what Kanye has done, I mean, he made billions. Look at Michael Jordan, made billions of dollars. I guess somebody, somebody impressed upon Trump that he, too, could make billions of dollars with, you know, um, these sneakers. In fact, I, I'll, I'll tell you something. He should actually go with something more that... He uses. I mean, obviously, we all know that Trump doesn't play basketball and shouldn't be in sneakers, more like maybe adult diapers or something. He should be in that sort of sphere as opposed to hawking sneakers. You know, there's a second part that goes to this as well, which I think we have to just take seriously. You have the head of one of our two major parties that's financially cash strapped. Simone was just making this point. Mm -hmm. We need to be very careful about him as a potential president because he's for sale. He needs to figure out where he's going to raise 500 plus million dollars over a short period of time. The and I Saudis, think that he needs to the be Russians, watched. yes, the Saudis, the Russians, like there are, he is... He is open to the highest bidder at this point because the, the, the tab keeps totally being run compromised, up. yeah. So, so let's let's stay with that a little bit. Um, how how does that then play itself out in this campaign? We see the setup play with the RNC uh, taking control of that, largely for the purposes of using those resources to to begin to offset some of that. Um, whether he's in the White House or not, I think the lesson that I've learned, at least from uh, what we saw at Mar-a-Lago is that Donald Trump will have, uh, he may not have the physical papers he can sell, but he knows stuff uh, that from his time in the White House. And he still, to some degree, is, as a former president, getting information um, that, that uh, a, president, a former president would get. How do you see him utilizing all of these assets, because that's what they are for him, uh, to sort of get to that end game of making uh, making these payments and and reestablishing his his march towards regaining those billions that you know the the sneakers notwithstanding. Yeah, any way that he can, you know, Mike, you and I have talked about this online and offline, and I had said that one of the biggest fears that I have, and I do believe that Donald will be held accountable on all 91 charges that have been brought against him in the four criminal indictments. One of the biggest fears I have about having Donald Trump behind bars is that he would sell this information for a bag of tuna or a, a book of stamps. He doesn't care about America. And I, will, and I say this not to be hyperbolic. I say, this, um, I say this as fact. Knowing him for as long as I've known him, he will sell that information to anyone because he doesn't care about anyone or anything other than himself, plain and simple. Mm. 
I mean, it is it, it 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 is still shocking to me that we we Donald Trump has just met zero consequences um, up until this year or late last year and this year. Um, the hush money case, as we talked about, is getting started. We obviously he's got this judgment in the civil case from Friday. What is a win? The hush money case for people that might not remember is about Stormy Daniels, the payments that she received. Um, you were intimately involved in that. It's, it's what you ended up going to um, jail for. And you te your testimony before Congress is the reason that this trial even exists because of something you said in the testimony before Congress. What is a win for Stormy Daniels in this case? Well, this has nothing to do with Stormy Daniels. I mean, people okay. want to, you know, it's salacious, right? It's the president and the porn star. It's not. It's campaign finance violations, business records fraud. That's really what the case is about. It doesn't have to do. Stormy is actually at the center of what the transaction was about, but it's not about Stormy Daniels. It's about, again, campaign finance as well as business record fraud. Um, so far, Simone, we have seen right now there are four criminal cases. There were two civil cases. The two civil cases, Donald has been held accountable, no different mm -hmm. than anybody else. That's why I constantly predict that he will be held accountable on all of the criminal cases as well. You know, how many times have you heard this statement that the wheels of justice turn slowly, but they ultimately come full circle? For Donald, it's now coming full circle, slower than we would like because of his delay tactics, but nevertheless, it comes full circle. As the legal fees are mounting, there is concern, specifically in this case, from Nikki Haley about Donald Trump using the RNC as his personal piggy bank. Um, she doesn't want the RNC to become Trump's legal defense fund. Is there any way, especially with him installing Laura Trump there, that that is not the inevitability? No. I mean, he now has his insider, his family member, that's going to be controlling the purse strings. Uh, if I was a donor... I would be very reluctant to send in a dollar. I find it odd that the people who have the least are yes. supporting a guy who has the most. Rest assured, if you need to go to Florida, Donald will not put you on his 757, <laughs> if, even if there's an open seat. He doesn't care. It's all a gigantic grift. We all know it. It's so blatantly obvious. We see it every single day what he's doing, but yet there is still that MAGA supporting group, the same folks that went out and bought for $400 those, you know, hideous looking sneakers, they're still willing to pony up money for him. Poor Michael Steele, he really uh, yeah. wanted a seat on that plane. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, uh, <laughs> wearing the sneakers, I, I think that would be. Because uh, nothing, Mike, shows that you're a racist, sexist, misogynistic, xenophobic, homophobic, Islamophobic, anti-Semite as a pair of Donald Trump hair felons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a mouthful. Uh, so, so, Michael, let, let's uh, pull back the lens a little bit, because the thread that I took away from um, uh, the judge's ruling um, really touched on a, a key element, and it was veracity. When he, when he looked at your testimony, um, he called it out. And talk to us a little bit about um, how you saw that, that representation by the judge in comparing it to what he heard from Donald Trump Jr., Eric Trump, um, and even Donald Trump himself relative to your testimony my sense was it really reinforced this decision in many, in many ways, what you had to say to that judge, despite the fact that, as the judge noted, that you were, you know, you know a felon, um, but you still brought the truth. Yeah, one of the things that I wish that the judge would have, and I thank Judge Angoron um, from the bottom of my heart for putting in that additional line, because remember, I have testified now before seven congressional committees, the Mueller team, the Manhattan district attorney, the attorney general, been on the grand jury uh, on the trial for that case and then soon to be on the witness stand for the Manhattan DA case. I've continuously told the same story, and the story is a truthful story. All of my information is it's predicated on both documentary evidence as well as corroborating testimony from others. So I do appreciate what I do wish that they would talk about 
is what my felony, what my perjury count was. And it was the number of times that I claimed to have spoken to Donald Trump about the failed Trump Tower Moscow real estate project. Donald wanted three because it's a de minimis number when the true number was 10. And I don't think that anybody should say, well, that's enough in order to not hold Donald Trump accountable for his dirty deeds, for his illegal behavior.